On today's show, a full breakdown of everything from Hawks Nuggets on Saturday evening and more and all that is coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. As a programming note, I am on the road covering the Final Four this weekend, and the internet was not going to hold up for a video recording. So this is a snippet that hopefully will come through, and the rest of the podcast will be audio only for those of you watching on YouTube. So stay tuned. That's coming up. Don't panic. The video is not supposed to be there, uh, but I want to get you the content as fast as I possibly can. So here we go. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1689 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland. Coming to you on a Saturday evening into Sunday, and today's show is brought to you by the folks at Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports, and the place to go is prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA, and use promo code LockedOnNBA when you get there for a first on the bottom match up to $100, and at the top of the podcast, I should encourage you, number one, to make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out and subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, places like Apple and Spotify, as well as YouTube. On the video side, and I should also apologize for the audio quality concerns or challenges on this podcast. As I said on the YouTube intro, I'm recording this podcast, actually, uh, let's just say offline. I'm actually literally in a car in Glendale, Arizona, because of internet challenges that transpired in my hotel. It just was not strong enough Wi-Fi to really record any kind of live setting, which includes video. So uh, I am going lo-fi here, and uh, hopefully it sounds reasonable. I was able to watch the game multitasking the first time through while covering the Final Four in Glendale and then was able to watch the game quickly again afterwards after I got back to the hotel. So uh, certainly a lot to get into on this podcast, but uh, thank you for being with me and I hopefully uh, you appreciate the fact that I was trying to get a podcast done and out to you despite the fact that it was a lopsided defeat for the Atlanta Hawks at the hands of the Denver Nuggets. Um, 142-110 to was the final in Denver this evening. That concludes an 0-2 road trip for the Hawks as they lose in Dallas in more competitive fashion and then lose in Denver tonight. They're now a game and a half behind the Bulls for the actually with four games to play for the Hawks. And given that Chicago has a tiebreaker, a decently uphill climb now for the Hawks to get the 9 seed in the 9-10 battle. And basically all that matters there would be the 9 seeds at home in that game. So uh, it is likely now, I would not say anything beyond likely, but certainly more likely than not, that the Hawks will probably have to go to Chicago for that 9-10 game. Nothing is assured at this point given all of that. Atlanta was down 13 at halftime. Um, they, were, they were sort of competitive, I would say, all the way through this game until about the fourth quarter. They couldn't get stops, though, in order to make a run in the second half. What you need to do, it's kind of a two-sided thing when you're trying to make a comeback um, at any level, really, but especially in the NBA, is that you have to get stops and you got to make shots. The Hawks made shots throughout this game, honestly, until, until the fourth quarter, but the stops were, uh, let's just say, few and far between in this contest. The final result, was a 32-point loss. Obviously, it wasn't quite that bad if you watch this game. They were down between 20 and 24 most of the way in the fourth quarter. But uh, yeah, it was not terribly competitive down the stretch, and the Hawks were really never made sort of in position to make that big run that you'd have to make to close the gap. The Hawks were shorthanded in this game, as they have been quite a bit recently, but they actually are getting a little bit healthier along the way, which we'll come back to later on in the podcast. The Nuggets actually lost a starter in this game. Aaron Gordon, one of their key guys, especially on defense, did not play in this contest, but they did have Jamal Murray back after a, about a seven-game absence with uh, with injury. So the Nuggets were certainly the healthier team. They were playing at home, and uh, our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook actually made the Hawks 10.5-point underdogs in this game. It was as high as 12, 12 and a half before Murray was ruled out. Um, but still, you know, going to Denver, the Nuggets are now 32 and 8 at home. It is pretty clearly, and this has been proven over multiple years, not, not, not just now because they're so good, but over years and years and years of data, given the uh, altitude mostly in Denver, it is the best home court advantage in the NBA. And the Hawks, I'm sure, felt that to some extent. Plus, the Nuggets are just really good as the reigning champions. So they were supposed to lose this game, quote unquote. Obviously, they were not supposed to lose this game by 32 points, but it is what it is. The Hawks were the underdog in this game for a reason. And big picture, I think you probably noticed by now, but if you watched this game or if you didn't watch the game, all you, and all you saw was the final score, the Nuggets had 100, 142 points in this game. And that kind of tells you that the defense was the problem for Atlanta in this contest. They had well over a 130 defensive rating in the game. It was over 140 until garbage time. So that tells you the, the big picture. The Hawks just could not get stops in this contest. Now, I'll be generous first off by saying that the Hawks got unlucky 
to some extent, again, to some extent, with the way that things broke in this game defensively, Denver shot 23 of 41 from three in this contest. And uh, some math on that, 56% from three for the Nuggets in this game. And uh, even in an empty gym, you're not going to shoot that all the time. So that's going to get you beat. Obviously, those 23 makes were a season high for Denver. They're not a huge high three-point team. They do make shots. They don't, they don't take a lot of threes normally. But I will say this, first of all, besides the fact that they were a little, a little bit unlucky in this game, that does not account for a 32-point loss. So even if you sort of normalize the shooting, the Hawks would have been behind the eight ball in this game. And I thought defensively they played pretty poorly on the whole Quinn post game talks about how they didn't feel them. It was kind of shades of Nate McMillan on that quote. But the Hawks did not play well defensively in this game, full stop. The margin was bigger because Denver shot the ball so well all the way through. But defensively, like it was kind of a mess. For instance, the Nuggets shot 64% on twos in the game. That's an elite figure for Denver as well. They had 38 assists. That's a sky high figure. They had 24 fast break points. The Hawks continue to be absolutely horrendous in that area of transition defense this year. They are bottom three in the league in both frequency and points allowed for possession in transition. They are really bad in that area. That was certainly showing through in this contest. The only area of strength defensively for the Hawks in this game was the fact that they were able to force 17 turnovers from Denver, but it was pretty grim outside of that. And again, kudos to the Nuggets. They have Jokic, who's the best player in the world. They have Murray back in this game. They shot the ball really well. KCP, old friend, uh, local Georgia product, shot the ball really well in this game. But the Nuggets are awesome, and they're not as awesome as the Hawks made them look in this game. The Hawks were poor defensively, and that coupled with Denver's hot shooting made things uh, pretty ugly at times on defense for the Hawks. Offensively, I have to say, the Hawks were pretty decent for most of this game. They scored, through three quarters, the Hawks had 86 points. They were shooting well from the floor. They were shooting well from three. They had 27 assists in three quarters, so like... In the mostly competitive portion of this game, the Hawks actually played pretty well on offense. Then in the fourth quarter, when things were kind of already decided slash really out of hand, the Hawks were 7 of 25 from the floor and 0 of 8 from 3. So if you were to sort of ignore that and look at the actual sample of competitiveness in this game, the Hawks were pretty good offensively. That downturn late did hurt the numbers overall. But the Hawks, the way I put this is the Hawks did what they had to do offensively in this game. Now, they weren't perfect on the end of the floor, but they gave themselves a chance to win. It was that defensively they were so bad that it didn't necessarily matter. They did have one issue. It was turning the ball over. Um, They had 14 turnovers through three quarters in this game. That's not, like, deeply horrendous, but they sort of needed to take take, uh, sort of less of those, let's just say. They did actually attempt 13 more free throws than the the Nuggets did, and they shot very well at the line in this game, 83%. So that's actually a uh, area where you wouldn't necessarily bank on the Hawks doing super well right now, but they did that. They had 30 assists in the game. They had six guys in double figures. Like they, they played well enough to win offensively, but in the end, nothing matters if you're going to allow like a 140, literally, <laughs> offensive rating to your opponent. So um, in the big picture, like this is the game that I wouldn't call it a schedule loss. It wasn't a back-to-back, but this is the third game in four nights. You're playing Denver at altitude. You're playing still without two or three of your key guys. Like, this is an area where it's hard to be frustrated with with the Hawks losing in a vacuum to the Nuggets. They're, quote-unquote, supposed to lose this game. The problem was, defensively, it left a lot to be desired. So, I understand the frustration. It's a Saturday night game. It's a late game. It's their last, 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 hopefully, late game of the year. A 9-10 start or so on the East Coast. So, if you watch this one all the way through, you are heroic in my book. But, in the end, the Hawks were uh, blitzed by Denver offensively in this one. And they never sort of got back from there. So, we'll get into how this game unfolded and uh, much more in a second. But first, a word from our sponsors on the podcast today. You can have up to 100 times the money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. That's right. For example, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with entry today at Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. And that's something for you for every single sports fan, from basketball and hockey to League of Legends and everything in between. You can pick LeBron and Jokic and Caitlin Clark and more all on the same entry at Prize Picks. It's the best possible way to get on the action in sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. And you can also play alongside some of Prospect's favorite players like Meek Mill and find them on our community plays under the Promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prospect's community each and every week. They also offer injury insurance Price Picks. Your, stay, your, play, your entry is going to say stay in play, even if one of your players happens to be injured. It's really simple to play. I can make the picks there in just a minute or less. Submit that entry. It's just that's huge for me to, t- to save time. One of the biggest reasons why I have really enjoyed playing there over the last few years and quick withdrawals as well, easy gameplay, an enormous selection of stat types and players. It helps to make Prospects the number one fantasy sports app. 
and download the PrizePix app right now today and use promo code LOCKEDONNBA for first time deposit match up to $100. Again, download the PrizePix app and use the code LOCKEDONNBA. When you get there, pick more, pick less. It's that easy with PrizePix. All right, and to start this game off, the Hawks actually shot it well to start the game. That was not a uh, huge outlier for the, West, the rest of the game, honestly. But, but in the early portion of both halves, they shot very well with the Stars on the floor. They had two threes early. They had 17 points in the first five and a half minutes. They did a good job, I thought, emphasizing Jalen Johnson in this game at times. The Nuggets didn't really have a great matchup for him with Gordon out of the lineup. They're a little bit smaller than they usually are on the wing. Um, they had Michael Porter Jr., but he's not a great defender, obviously. Um, and I thought the Hawks did a good job spacing in the first quarter of this contest, but they were not getting stops, and that, of course, persisted throughout the game. Um, it was the usual nine-man rotation for the Hawks in recent days. It was the starters, plus Vic Krejci, Garrison Matthews, Bruno Fernando, and then Kobe Bufkin as the backup point guard in this game. But as soon as V, Garrison, and Bruno came into the game, the Hawks got destroyed. It was a 10-0 run. As soon as they entered the game, they had seven straight trips on offense where they actually couldn't score. Um, two of those were actually pretty, pretty loose by Garrison. They were on kind of open threes, but they didn't score a point for like three and a half minutes. And they managed to kind of stabilize things, and were only down by six at the end of the first quarter, but the damage was kind of done. They never actually led again in this game. Um, Denver actually went up by 15 points by the middle of the second quarter. The Hawks did kind of punch back from there with Bogey and Garrison getting a little bit hot. And then actually the Hawks had a 14 to five run after they were down by as many as 17 points in the second quarter to get the lead all the way down to eight. They actually scored seven points to begin that run with on three possessions. That was encouraging offensively. They kind of slowed down from there as they did in kind of every quarter of this game for the most part. But Denver made 11 threes in the half. The Hawks did shoot 17 free throws in that first half, which is a ton for them, but they uh, were not able to kind of sustain that throughout the entire rest of the way. The third quarter was similar to the first quarter in a lot of ways. The Hawks made seven of their first eight shots. They made three threes in that stretch. They scored 18 points in about four and a half minutes. Unfortunately, though, they were down 11 still because... That's kind of why I said it was a flashback, because it was the same thing, and they, they just couldn't necessarily make gains, even when they were scoring. But I have to say, like, the offense, with the starters in particular, was quite good in this game all the way through. But by the middle, uh, sort of late portions of the third quarter, it was kind of rough. Um, Denver had 93 points with 18 minutes left in the game. It was a 30-13 to overall run from Denver to go from the Hawks being down by 9 in the third quarter to down by six, sorry down by 26 points late in the period. Denver was scoring at an obscene clip, and for the second time in the game, the Hawks had an extended uh, drought offensively, again with the bench on the floor. We'll come back to that later on, but the bench had uh, real issues in this game for sure. They had eight points in about the last five and a half minutes of the third quarter to kind of end the game in some respects. One way to frame this is actually kind of funny. The Hawks shot 62% from the field in the third quarter, which is obviously an awesome number, and they lost the quarter by 12 points. One more time. You should never lose a quarter by, by 12 points when you shoot 62% from the field in the quarter. But even with the late downturn in the third, it was all, it was fine on offense. It really was. But everything else was rough because Denver had 42 points and shot 70% from the field in the third quarter. And at the end of that, the Hawks were down by 25 points, and that was essentially the end of the game. It wasn't totally over, I will say. like Crazy things have happened, but um, the Hawks were certainly uh, in some trouble at that point in time. Now, to their credit, they didn't roll over as they kind of never do this year. They're, they got it back to 19 pretty quickly in the, in the fourth quarter. It never, though, felt like it was going to be interesting, honestly. Um, they, they kind of chipped away a little bit, but if it wasn't already over, Zeke Nagy made a three to put the Hawks down by like 25, 26 in the middle of the fourth quarter. That was kind of the end of the game. I will do my nightly bit about this now. Um, the coaching staff and Clint Snyder left the starters in longer than he should have. And I've said this a lot in recent days. If you're a new listener, this is a recurring theme. But the wild one for me was that Bogey was the last starter on the on the floor, and he was the guy that I would be want, kind, of, kind of keeping an eye on the most. I think Bogey and Capella and Murray are playing a lot of minutes right now, and I think that keeping an eye on those guys would be a good idea. And for whatever reason, Quinn just does not pull the plug. They were down by 28, 29 points before, before everybody came out of the game. I don't want to get it, but there you go. Um, one highlight, Mo Gay got into, the, got into the game at the end of this one um, for about four minutes. He had not been active for an NBA game since November. He had not played an NBA game since October the 30th. Now, he played some in the G League, but Mo had a long-term back injury, and then he's had this elbow issue in recent days. But um, I thought and said as much on social media that he wasn't going to play in the rotation. He did not play. 
I think if I had to guess, he won't play in the rotation at all down the stretch. But maybe if they have a game that's not like meaningful in the standings, they might, they might do that. But no matter what, it's good to see Mo on the floor. Obviously, a, a very talented player, um, more of a future-facing piece in some ways because he's had a long weird season with injury stuff, but uh, you, you sort of see the flashes, and I was encouraged to see him on the floor. It's kind of a shame that Seth Lundy had an ankle issue in this game, or he would have probably played some down the stretch too, but that was uh, one of the small bright spots in this contest, was that Mogay was able to play some minutes, and uh, yeah, it was it was rough, I have to say. like The Hawks lost in the end every quarter of the game. Um, they were never able to put a huge run together. They had one run in the first half, but offensively, it just wasn't it was good it wasn't great and then defensively like I said before it was uh pretty dire just to throw some numbers on this uh Jokic only played three quarters basically and had 19 14 and 11 the Nuggets had seven sorry six guys with at least 13 points Reggie Jackson had 18 points off the bench for Denver Peyton Watson was really good in this game etc there was really not a lot that went, that went wrong for Denver along the way which means there's a lot that went wrong for the Hawks along the way all right we'll have more on this game when it comes to the player-by-player evaluations, as I always do on the podcast. But first, they were from our sponsors on the show. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Where you're hired for a small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the roles that you have available. And that's why you should check out the folks at LinkedIn Jobs. They have the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team. They help you to do it faster, and they help you to do it for free. I've been on the hunt for people to hire in my day job for a few times in the past. And they really, I would say, LinkedIn Jobs has been huge in helping me make the entire process much easier and much more efficient. They know that small businesses are often wearing a ton of different hats and they may not have time or resources to actually hire properly. And LinkedIn is not just another job board either. They have a network of more than 1 billion professionals, which makes it the best possible place to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you can't find anywhere else. And they do it all by making the process easy and intuitive at LinkedIn Jobs. Hiring is much easier when you have that many quality candidates available to you. It's so easy, in fact, that 86% of businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours at LinkedIn Jobs. We're helping you make the process easier and 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn Jobs for hiring. Push your job for free by going to linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. One more time. That is linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. Terms and conditions apply. All right. And before I dive into the player stuff in this game, some injury check in here. Of course, the Hawks still had four or five guys out in this one Trey Young, Anyaka Kangwu. Um, Sadiq Bey, AJ Griffin, all still out in this contest. Trey did get something of an update um, on his own podcast, so it was in his own words, not an official team release, but obviously Trey has the incentive and has the platform to share his own stuff. Um, he talks about how he has set to meet with his doctor on Monday, and he hopes to have the brace off of his hand after that meeting. Nothing is assured there. It's a hope thing, but still. He also said he's not even been able to make a fist with that wrist, and that wrist slash hand slash finger at this point in time. And as I, as I record this into Sunday morning, the Hawks play their last game of the year. Game 82 is a week from today, as I'm recording this podcast on Sunday. So it's going to be a photo finish. There was some optimism in the way that Trey was framing about playing in the next week or so. Um, that could be playing, you know, practice level stuff, not necessarily playing on games. It's vague. Um, the, Haw- the Hawks, as a team, have said basically nothing about this in recent days other than Quinn doing his normal vague updates. But um, keep in mind that, like, this is a short window. The Hawks, I guess in theory, Trey is the kind of player where he had, he might have the juice to, if he gets cleared, he could in theory make his return in the 9-10 playing game. That wouldn't be totally insane, although it sounds like it sounds pretty crazy to me. But because of who he is, if he's cleared and he's able to play, he's probably going to play in that game. The hope would be that he gets back in advance of the last game of the season or whatever. So the Hawks have you know, seven days until the finale, and then they have another two or three days after that to play the 9-10 game. So hold your breath. I've been saying for a long time, like, it's not guaranteed he comes back, but I think this is this timeline's kind of uh, in line with that. Very much of a photo finish again. Not to say that exact phrase again, but I think the Hawks um, could should be prepared to not have to not have Trey. But if he plays, he plays. That'd be obviously be better. He, they're better with him. That's a another story altogether. But uh, keep an eye on that in the coming days. I know I will be on this podcast over the next seven to ten days. Um, big picture: the bench got hammered in this game, with the exception of Kobe Bufkin and his um, backup minutes behind Ajante, behind the Jante, the rest of the bench struggled, let's just say. Um, not necessarily individually that much, but just those those lineups did not go well in this contest. Uh, Bruno Fernando, 18 minutes, minus 28 in those minutes for Bruno. 3-9 from the floor, did have five, six rebounds and two assists, but he got blitzed by Jokic and even by the backup units for Denver. Five fouls, 
He struggled in this one, as most guys did. Garrison Matthews hit two threes. He's been hot from there, but he didn't do a whole lot else. Had two steals to draw a foul. A three-shot foul had 11 points, so he played fine, but those laps, again, did not work. B. Krejci was quiet in this one. Three points, five rebounds, two assists in 25 minutes. He was minus 24 in this contest. Kobe was quiet-ish, too. Did have four points and three assists in his 14 minutes of play. He was two of three on twos, 0 of three on threes. Um, looked fine to me, but didn't play a ton before garbage time in the fourth quarter. And then Moge, four points. Did, did, he took three shots, actually missed them all, but uh, he was eager and w- eager and willing to fire some shots up down the stretch, but obviously it was pure garbage time. But just, it, again, the big thing is that he played in this game. Good to see Mo back on the floor. To the starters. Um, the plus minuses don't necessarily tell the whole story, but they kind of do. When the Hawks had their starting five together, things went fairly decently. And when they had the trio of Bogdanovich, Capella, and Jalen Johnson on the court, they actually were really kind of competitive in this game. It was everything else. So we'll go to the guy who played the least in the starting lineup. That was DeAndre Hunter, who played 29 minutes, 18 points. He actually had 12 in the first half to lead all scores. Then only had one rebound, two assists, um, three of three on twos, but two of eight from three. He was not great in this game. I thought he was okay, but uh, not, a, not a huge impact. Jalen had a good start to this one. Ended up with 17 points, six rebounds, four assists. They have six turnovers, though. That's a lot for him. And he was only one of five from three. He was inefficient. 17 points on 18 shots is not what you want from Jalen, but I think he had at least had some flashes. Not his best work, though, overall. Uh, Bogey had 18 points, two assists, two rebounds, and he was actually the only guy in the starting lineup besides Capella that shot the ball well. He was uh, three of four, sorry, three of six on twos, three of four on threes in this game, uh, only minus eight. So Jalen was minus eight. Bogey was minus eight. Capella was minus four in 30 minutes in a 32-point game. So, essentially, it wasn't as clean as this, but the Hawks got killed with Capella off the floor, and they were pretty good with him on the floor, at least okay with him on the floor. That's been a theme a lot recently. Like, Clint's on-off numbers for the last six weeks or so are pretty excellent. Anyway, he had 19 points, 12 rebounds, and three assists in this game. Got to the line 12 times, made nine of them. That's actually pretty good for Clint. Um, five, six from the floor. He was really good. I, for whatever reason, people never seem to buy in, but I think Clint's been playing very well for a long, a long period of time here. Uh, again, game best plus minus there. Uh, Murray, not his best. 14 points. They have 12 assists. That's a good number, of course, but he was 4 15 from the floor. Only one of seven on twos for DeJounte in this one, kind of weirdly. Three away from three, but not efficient and uh, defensively struggled a little bit in this one. No one played super well. I have to say, I think Capella probably had the best night of anybody, but even then, he was having to deal with Jokic, and nobody can deal with the Jokic show. It was uh, not the most fun at the office for the Hawks in this game on the whole, but again, when the Stars were on the floor together, the results were decent. Not defensively, but on, off- on offense, they were able to score. Defensively, no one could stop anybody in the entire game, and the offense kind of fell off a cliff when the bench unit came into the game. All right, I will leave you with that on a shortened, probably short version of this podcast. I'm not sure where I am time-wise, but I'm sure it's shorter than usual. Part of that's blowout loss. Part of that's the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm recording in a car. But um, yeah, from here, the Hawks do play um, not not till Tuesday. Actually, they have two days off to kind of get back to Atlanta. They'll fly back on uh, basically overnight into Sunday, and then they'll have Monday off. They play again on Tuesday for the last two home games of the regular season and potentially of the season. Because if the Hawks are the 10 seed, they would have to win two road games to even make the playoffs, and then from there, obviously, they have to they actually be in a series. But there's a decent chance. The Hawks have two more games at home in the season. We'll, we'll see on that. But they play Tuesday against Miami, and then Wednesday against Charlotte, a couple of divisional games. Miami, of course, is still playing for position in the Eastern Conference pecking order, in the standings, in the play-in race, in the, in the six-seed race, all that stuff. That, that'll be a game with some real stakes on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, the Hornets have been a bugaboo for the Hawks. They did beat them last time, but uh, they're not playing for anything right now other than the lottery balls. So keep an eye on those two games. Then the Hawks go on the road for the last two games of the year. Um, at the end of next week, and then Sunday is the finale in the afternoon. So, uh, yeah, a lot going on there, but we'll have a full coverage of this one. Given the situation that I'm in in Glendale slash Phoenix right now with my internet, if it's not better, I won't have a show between now and Tuesday. So my, my apologies for that, but um, it is what it is. I will try to do my best to have a show on Tuesday, provided I get home to Atlanta in a projected fashion, as I'm supposed to be home on Tuesday. So stay tuned for all that. But uh, the best thing you can do is to subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, places like Apple and Spotify, as well as YouTube on the video side. Please rate and review and share and tell a friend or two or three and family members, all that stuff, enemies too. Share the podcast with them. I really would appreciate all of that. We've been here for almost 1,700 episodes at this point in time and no plans to slow down in the near future. So please subscribe 
Tell a friend. Thank you for listening very much. Follow the show on Twitter slash X at Lots on Hawks. Follow me there as well at BT Roll and also write about the Hawks and also share bonus audio at patreon.com slash BT Roland. So I appreciate all the support on that endeavor as well. Thanks for everybody, and we'll see you all next time.